Today's July 3rd, 2017. Happy 4th of July to all of our U.S. listeners. You're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 48. This week's episode is all about smartphones making us dumb, 180-degree virtual reality, and we're addressing the philosophical debate of who is responsible if your brain-controlled robot drops a baby. We're also jumping back into the community and answering your Reddit questions. Baby, you're a firework, and Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast, the only podcast that drops Katy Perry lyrics in their intro. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnstorff. You know, Nick, I was wondering where I heard those words before, and when I read them, I didn't get it, but as soon as you said it, I was going to laugh. Well, it's 4th of July. We got to have a little fun. Blake, how you doing, oh, buddy? certainly. Not too bad, man. Not too bad. How you been doing this week? You know, I'm good. I'm good. You know, when we banter here at the beginning of the show, we usually talk about human factor stuff. Do you have anything human factor stuff that you want to talk about this week? You know, I had a couple... I'll call them interesting experiences today with some uh, some companies like Verbal AI or voice systems. You know, like when you if you call in a customer service line, they'll send you through like a series of questions trying to get you to the right person. Have you ever used one of those? For, yeah. Like, your, your like charter or something like that. Yeah, well, you're... I used two different, very different ones today. And I found that I seemed to get a lot more frustrated with the AI system when it was a robot than when it sounded more human like. And I thought it was just kind of a silly coincidence because i mean for on one end of the spectrum i was kind of getting really mad and yelling at a robot um when it sounded more robotic but when it had like a more human and fluid conversational tone i felt like one the ai was working better in that case but two i just i didn't get super mad or anything if something went wrong i was like oh okay so i feel like there's got to be something going on there as far as like if you think you're hearing a more human voice eh. I shouldn't be so so angry if something goes wrong. Well, I mean, so we've talked about humans, or sorry, computers being social actors on the show before, but like, so so I think what's happening there is when it's robotic, you expect it to be a computer and compute things correctly, whereas if it has a hum- more human elements to the AI voice, right? Like, I feel, I feel like that's almost inviting you to sort of uh, forgive it for some mistakes if it does make mistakes. Most definitely. But that that was kind of my little little experience for the day with AI. What about you, Nick? Have you got anything <clears throat> cool HF related happen this week or See, anything otherwise? You know, so I don't really have anything human factors related. Um, but I'm always looking out for things. And, and uh, you know, I had a real, not, not a human factors moment, but a real human moment this weekend. And it was actually quite moving and refreshing. And I kind of like to share um, have you heard of, well, first of all, have, have, you're in Southern California too. Have you ever heard of this, uh, California science center over at USC? No, I haven't. I saw it in the notes. And I admit, was like really excited to hear where it was and what it was all about. Right, right, right. So obviously it's a science center. They have, that's where they keep the endeavor, the space shuttle endeavor. Um, yeah. and, uh, they have right now a, uh, a body worlds exhibit. And this is basically, uh, it, it how do I put this? It's it's basically real human bodies uh, that people have dedicated to science, and they I, it's through a process they do this called like plasterization. I think I think that's what it's called. Don't hold me to that. Um, but essentially, they have these human bodies with muscles and everything uh, f- fully on display. And they basically, it's like mummification to the next degree where you can actually see these bodies. And it is, it's it's so visceral because you are looking at somebody's actual body. Uh, and that's all well and fine. But one of the, 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 the thing that got to me the most in this exhibit, believe it or not, was the, the part where you interact with real living human beings or not so much interact with them, but, but uh, see their thoughts and feelings. There's... 
there's a part of the exhibit where at the very end, after after going through all this stuff and seeing what the human body is and what it's capable of and how it does things like reproduction and um, you know keeps itself alive, basically, there there's this there's this moment at the very end where you can sign a, uh, a, a I don't know it's a card and and you put it on this thing and on on the card it says uh a thing i want to do before i die right and um you know some so just like i'm not going to repeat them because they were on display there and i feel like i would do a disservice if i were to repeat them on the show but just looking at at what people write when faced with their own mortality when when they are forced to face the fact that they will die someday, some of the things that people wrote was tremendously moving. I sat there in the middle of this thing just reading what other people had written, and uh, I, I found myself incredibly moved, almost to the point of tears. And honestly, man, like I don't, I don't cry from looking at art, and it's not, it's, it's not that I don't appreciate it. It's just that I, it's, it's not my demeanor. But man, I have to say, like sitting in the middle of all these hopes, fears, and things that people want to accomplish before they leave this earth, it, it was it was the most moving experience I've had in a very long time. Yeah, I mean that sounds like a totally sobering experience to get to read other people's thoughts about like, well, if when. Since I know that life is ultimately going to end, this is what I want to do. And I'm sure for a lot of people, that's something you just never really think about on a daily basis. So you probably get some some serious emotional thought put into those responses. That's really cool, man. Yeah. No, it was I I I, uh, I recommend this exhibit 100 percent if you're in the Southern California area and uh, just have an appreciation for the human body. I mean, you should. You are a human and you're listening to Human Factors cast. I mean, I. I can't recommend it enough. It's like 20 bucks to get in. Do it. It's it's worth it. Uh, and then you'll be able to see that exhibit that I talked to you about. Uh, it, it's really just worth it. All right, man. Well, are you ready to get into some Human Factors news? Let's do it, man. All right. So let's move on to the part of the show all about Human Factors news. This could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, whatever it is. As long as uh, as long as it has to do with the field of Human Factors, it is fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right. So assistant professor Adrian Ward and his colleagues from the Macomb School of Business at the University of Texas conducted experiments with nearly 800 smartphone users in an attempt to measure how well people can complete tasks when they have their smartphones nearby. Across two different experiments, researchers found that cognitive capacity was significantly reduced when a person's smartphone was present, even when their cell phone was turned off. Assistant Professor Ward noted that, quote, it's not the participants were distracted because they were getting notifications on their phones. The mere presence of the smartphone itself was enough to reduce their cognitive capacity. So this is something I've always wanted to see what would happen if it was actually researched. Because I don't know about you, Nick, but I definitely get the feeling that even when I have my smartphone around and I'm not getting any notifications, like I've put that sucker on airplane mode. I'm still distracting myself by picking it up, looking at it, just as like as a, as a force of habit. So I thought this was a pretty interesting study to show that even if something's turned off, it's distracting you from like your main task. Yeah, and I I have had a sneaking suspicion for a long time that this was the case, and uh, you know I wonder if the same thing goes with um, stuff like uh, smartwatches or just regular watches or any sort of device that helps keep you in sync with the world. I, I am not blown away by these results, but it's good to see that people are out there thinking about this stuff and actually testing to see whether or not it works. Yeah, and I mean, I guess the funny part is, I mean, you could even be distracted by your watch just by the fact, because, I mean, what they really talk about is it's not so much that you're, distracted by using the thing or in this case a smartphone it's the fact that you're having to take cognitive resources to actively almost kind of tell yourself like hey don't mess with your phone right now even though it's in your view or near you you have something you're trying to do and so that was really what they were getting at with in terms of 
your cognitive capacity decreases with just the phone being in your periphery or in the same room as you. Well, yeah, and I mean, I, I, I what is it? Uh, phantom vibration sy- sim- syndrome. I used to. Yes. I used yeah. to experience this a long time ago, but like I don't anymore because no one ever calls me, and I I've made it that way for a reason. But like uh, the, the the thing that I'm wondering about, so. Imagine you have uh, your smartphone's in another room, and and you know it's not there, but you still reach into your pocket to like check it. Is is that a uh, a byproduct of this as well? And I'd imagine so. But I I, I wonder. I, I guess I'm just wondering what the difference is between somebody who's like never owned a smartphone and doesn't want to reach for them uh, because they don't know any better, um, you know, versus like a dumb phone. I guess. Uh, it, is that what we're calling them, dumb phones? But you know what that what that different is difference is. Excuse me, between checking a phone for Facebook versus checking a phone because you feel it vibrate and you're trying to answer a call. I don't know, but uh, do we want to jump into the 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 experiments here on what they did? Yeah, let's let's give people like at least some kind of semblance of what was going on. Uh, so I can hop into experiment one. Sure. So well, all the researchers did, they just had participants sit down at a computer to take a series of cognitive cap- capacity tests. So that what they were looking to assess was your brain's ability to hold and process data at any given time. And in order to do all well in these tests, you, of course, have to concentrate pretty hard, can't really be distracted, things of that nature. So before participants began the test, though, they were instructed to either place their smartphones face down on the desk in front of them, in their pocket or personal bag, or in an entirely different room. Um, and as a little added, added note, all participants were also asked to put their phones on silent. And what researchers found was that participants with their phones in another room significantly outperformed those with the phones on the desk, and only slightly outperformed those who kept their phones like in a pocket or a bag. Uh, but still, these there you're showing a difference in cognitive capacity just because of the presence of a phone, um, which that is pretty interesting in and of itself. Um, and like it says, I mean, the, the biggest thing this is implicating is it's, it's not so much that you're distracted by what's going I said earlier, the phone's face down, even when it's present in the room, it's just more of you having to think up. You don't want to use your phone, and so that's requiring you to use up resources and your attention. That's like taking away from, let's say, doing these um, cognitive tests. Right. Well, I work in spaces sometimes where I'm required to leave my phone at the door. This is back to that point that I was saying. Like, I, I wonder what happens. If it's something unfamiliar to you as a research participant, and so I'm wondering if when they visit these spaces, they're they're thinking, oh, thing, get in, get out, and I'm done. Versus in situations where you do have to check your phone, environment to you, but you still reach for your phone. You know what I'm mean? saying? Do you kind of get that difference? And although I don't think it answers it completely, I think you do have some merit experiment too, at least in the sense of, okay, we know that pe- we're putting people in a novel context. Some people are likely to be using their phones more often as it is. So maybe maybe some of the differences we're seeing is only because one they're in this space and two maybe some performance when it's out of the room. Right. So let's uh, go ahead and jump into experiment two here. So it looks like they, in addition to it, it seems uh, the uh, smartphone dependence measures as well as the most dependent on their smartphones perform worse compared to the people who are less dependent in the pocket or in the bag. So if it's completely separated, it's uh, it, they perform the same. I've done that myself. Like there was a lab I used to work in where I couldn't take my cell phone in there because that's just like part of the rule. Yeah. So as the study suggests, just the mere presence of your smartphone. I'm using a VR headset. You know that the whole 360 video thing can get old. A portion of the content would have been just fine only looking forward. YouTube's new, however, does sacrifice some of the VR immersion, but VR 180 could make it a lot easier for create uh, between the two of us you have the most experience so what is your take on cutting basically the here's the thing you it, it's not i i struggle to call it call it that it's like glorified 3d at this point because you're not you're not you could put 3d goggles on your face and watch a 3d movie uh with us when you have a 3d environment 
and you're trying to tell a story or trying to, del to deliver a reality headset to look at the thing you want it to look at. And so by cutting out half of on the headset, but because the field of view is limited to 180, there's a good chance that kind of my thoughts and i mean we actually talked about this last year at hfes there was a uh, there was a paper or a presentation a vr movie with no direction versus a vr movie with direction and the retention quickly off the top of my head what that was but i know we've talked about it before and i know that this would kind of guide your attention a little bit more it's almost like putting blinders on a horse yeah i mean that that's a really good analogy for that that purpose and i mean it makes sense that in terms of trying to create more like more the norm in terms of how you like watch videos or things outside games that you would use VR for. I mean, it makes creation. Uh, but I do agree with you that I feel like in some ways it's still a stretch to call it VR because that full, like being able to look anywhere experience and being a VR and immersion, that's what I think of it. Like if I was watching a story, I could wander off in any direction regardless of like what is, what's supposed to be the main focal. I, I mean, anything can be, classified as a virtual environment as long as you filmed it right it's it's not real it's simulated it's it's captured on video and played back whatever it is it's a virtual environment and and i i think it's obviously case by case basis but i i honestly think that in the case where you want to deliver content where people are trying to absorb something or it's a little bit too far up or to the right or to the left you're you're just going to see a black screen so it's there's less stitching with the cameras that you have to do. There's, uh, you know, the, or the 360 degree effect. Cause in that context, it makes, makes the most sense, but in trading basic VR content, this is a great way to go. And also it's for, if you're trying to get somebody to pay, either like learn something or, or just show them a how, like a how to video, it's it in half as in terms of focusing attention. I agree. I want to make one more quick comment before we move on to the next, which is this, may be the sort of, I don't want to say the gateway, but it, it will be a deciding factor in uh, the accessibility. If you have this and people can strap a phone to their face and look at this stuff, it not take much to track your head in terms of 180 degrees. You can do that with a camera. You can do that with the phone in your pocket. Like, So making, making virtual reality accessible is going to be what, source all these advances in research and technology so i think it's good but uh i don't know if it's necessary i yeah i i'm i'm of mixed feelings on it so all right let's go ahead and uh move on to the next story but before we do i'd like to thank you to all of our friends at recode the next web and science daily for all of our articles this week if you want to follow along original articles as we find them all right, Blake, what do we got up next? All right, so a little bit of Facebook this week. So Facebook's mission is to connect everyone in the world. And with last week's nearly 2 billion total users, it's certainly getting closer. However, getting to 3 billion improvements to wireless infrastructure. But first and foremost, everyone will have to have access to the Internet. So Facebook is hoping to speed things along with an Internet B. The drone is lightweight. It's a solar-powered aircraft that hopes to be currently off the grid. But this will take some time. Facebook first announced completed its second flight test with about a 5% of the minimum elevation it hopes to reach. Now, this is uh, I don't know, this blows my mind because you're basically creating drone technology, which is not new, but in this case, it's trying to be at a full, like almost a global scale product that is now going to beam wireless internet into remote areas that don't have it and i feel like for facebook and for i guess globally whatever like uh, uav because I, I know in the states we have the faa but now there's got to be some kind of cross coordination with how these kind of things can operate in different global airspaces so blake let me ask you a few things man so this is this is essentially like an in atmosphere satellite that beams that that's like the best that's the best analogy i can come up with uh that beams internet it basically flies along a um a flight path and it uses solar power to all stay airborne for as long as possible just using solar power is that the one that i'm thinking of or is this something different what might be confusing you is there i mean they're in such early test phases for this uh. um 
because I'm like, like it mentions in the article, like they're only reaching five percent in a wide range from the UAV or from the drone, uh, down to rural areas that, that are not like, co- that are in question is how does this relate to human factors? We're talking about engineering of a plane and Facebook. Will yeah. So for, for me, this kind of struck a big chord in my head in terms of just how you regulate something like this. And also, you're now going to, it's not necessarily forcing upon, but you're giving people access to something they've never had before. So in this case, internet. So how are you going to teach people to even use it, to use smartphones or to use computers or get on the internet and see what people are actually supposed to do? But what, what I had worked on for a long time um, earlier in my career was just doing research on basically this, how to develop actual regulations for UAVs themselves. Uh, so this just seemed to, in my head, require a lot of really testing of how it's going to interact in airspace, depending on, like, if it is a third world country, what are those rules and how is it going to integrate within that specific class of airspace Um, and that just requires a lot of interaction between different types of engineers like you mentioned but i guess the big question for me is you're almost it seems like facebook is now trying to reach a user population that may have no experience with the technology it wants to give them so how are they going to even once they have the internet how are they going to get people to adopt the software right well i uh i don't know if you follow bill nye a whole lot I am fairly familiar with him. Yeah, uh, he he has this thought where basically, if you provide internet to the people who don't have it, they will learn things fairly quickly. Once they learn how to use the internet, they'll be able to pick up on things, and then the world will be better off because of it. Um, and yeah, you you bring up an absolutely critical point here: is, is how do you sort of bring people through the 1990s, where internet was becoming mainstream, and bring them up to the 2017 where it's changed dramatically from what it was then. I, I, I think there's um, a lot to be said about interaction and especially cross-cultural interaction as it pertains to opening up these, uh, these other countries that didn't have the internet up until this point. So it's definitely full with challenges for human factors folk. Most definitely. I think, I think kind of the biggest one Two is the type of content that's being provided on Facebook. All of a sudden, now a lot of people have a lot more freedom of what they can say or what they can go and find, depending on, of course, regulations within a country um, for Internet. Uh, so I, th- I think it'll just be a very interesting climb to that three billion people, how how people adopt it, what how they actually use it, if different uses of Facebook come out. Because we talked about, uh, I think it was last week, how or maybe a couple of weeks ago now that Facebook had developed or was using some of its like user data to help out with natural disasters. Well, right, right, this right. gives them further reach or there's some other implication that hasn't been thought of because it's a different, it's a totally different population, like a, a 1 billion person population that has been tapped into. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely some unique challenges here. Uh, I'm excited to see where it goes for sure though. Uh, especially once they get these things up there flying indefinitely. Oh yeah, it'll it'll be interesting. But like, the, here's kind of the the other side of the coin that I had, and this goes back to maybe more of process design. But this is the second flight in I guess two years. First first flight was a a crash, so it was not successful. This time you're hitting like five percent of the elevation that you want to eventually reach. Um, and there's not a whole lot of mention in the article, and I didn't. I didn't find anything through digging about how well the service of the plane actually works. So how well the actual beaming of the service of internet um, is coming from the aircraft. So I just feel like this has such a long way to go and is from the testing they've done and the engineering teams they put together, are they only going to focus on this aircraft solution or are there other ways that we could go about it? Right. Yeah. It's definitely interesting. And, uh, We'll be curious as to where it goes from here. All right, we ready to move on to the next one? Yes. Let's let's do do it. More Facebook stuff. Yeah, so a little bit of a different turn looking at Facebook. So we've come to know Facebook as a brand that's synonymous with 
of course, the social media platform, but it's also responsible responsible for advances in VR through Ocul- Ocul- <laughs> Oculus Rift. Oculus. And it's even has its own Skunk Works facility at this point, the elusive Building 8. But Facebook is facing a problem that is and that is that its growth has been driven by its flagship platform for the last five years, won't be able to sustain it anymore in the next five. So user growth is, of course, slowing as it taps into more people, and newsfeed saturation has led Facebook to warn its content publishers of a rapid deceleration in revenue growth over the next six months. So this means that Facebook will need to attract content publishers and retain them by providing more ad space that competes with the return on investments of its counterparts, such as YouTube. Uh, And for Facebook, this likely means in the short term, sacrificing the overall user experience of their product by placing ads in more um, user generated content areas. And this gets at a common problem that we face throughout the UX community or as human factors professionals, that how do you convince parties to play the long game and not sacrifice UX in the short for the short term gains? Now, Nick, this is a little bit of a different kind of turn for stories that we talk about. This this article is very revenue and marketing and growth based, but I thought it had a really big implication for us in the field because this is the age old problem of how do you convince people to look a little further than the end of their nose as far as if you create a better experience and really think out what you can do with the money you have now and instead of trying to go for short-term gains and cutting your losses with regards to how people experience your product what do you do to what are better ways you can go about trying to do this and now facebook that is so big and makes so much money is now having to answer to stakeholders that are realize and they're quickly realizing that the growth rate is going to slow to a certain point that they won't be able to meet those standards without sacrificing user experience. Right. Yeah. So you're talking about the whole argument of do we, do we, obviously the best experience is an ad free experience, which is why so many of us download ad blockers and you know, we, we, don't notice them when they're not there, but we definitely do notice them when they are there. And it's annoying because we sort of, we know that they're targeting us. And so, uh, yeah, it's that whole argument of how do we, how do we introduce ads to make that revenue, but not sacrifice the user experience? I think it's a really interesting sort of problem that we face because I don't know about you, Blake, but I've worked in companies where, you're not necessarily at odds with the marketing machine, but it's you you really have to work together for you to both accomplish the goals. Yeah, and that's that's a big part of I think bridging that gap of understanding how the two of you are so connected and understanding each other's goals and what you need to achieve in order to like meet your part of the business's objectives is gonna be the important part of trying to do something like this, like save the user experience. And also too, like now we're seeing it from Facebook, finally having to think about digging in and to add space. that's going to be very evasive. But what I've seen, at least through the mobile experience, I mean, especially with trying to read like articles on the go for, for the show or for anything else that I do is that ads are very invasive to you. Like they're either pop-ups that are over the screen. They're right. always located at the bottom or you have to scroll. There's like, if you've ever read an article, I have to scroll through an ad in order to even get to the last year content. Like there's, there's plenty of sites that I've stopped using completely because of that. Yeah. So I think like uh, Facebook has come up with a lot or a few options that they can tackle, but I think really in the future, it's going to be taking human, human factors or user experience professionals into the space of, okay, we're in this really confined point in our company's growth and we have to figure out how to make both the ads tolerable enough that people will still use the con- use our platform, but also give people opportunities as far as these publishers that are making us so much money to keep to keep them looped in and not go to other platforms. So I think it, I just think it presents a very tough challenge, but I mean it's it's kind of becoming more and more, especially in the social media space, part of the UX job, like understanding the marketing and how to get around putting in rad ad revenue on top of good content for your user. Yeah, yeah. Did you want to go over these options? Uh, we can. Okay, well, but hang on. Before we do, I just want to say a few things. 
One, I'm going to come back to that whole uh, user experience group communicating with the marketing group later when we talk about Reddit. Uh, also, I just want to remind everybody that we bring these shows to you ad free. <laughs> <laughs> Because oh it provides an excellent user experience. So uh, if you're listening and appreciate that, we would love a review in return. So go on over, point your browser or mobile device without ads to Apple Podcasts, Google Play, wherever you find your podcasts, and leave us a good review. Uh, we really appreciate those. All right. Now that I'm done uh, self-promoting the podcast, those are the only advertisements that you'll get in Human Factors Cast for the foreseeable future. So I figure we can do it. All right, let's go over these options to save UX. Yeah, so they talk about in instant articles, they, it could be faster with a more acceptable ad than an actual than the actual mobile web. Uh, so this is just basically kind of what we alluded to, having within the article itself, you get to read such amount of content, and then at some point you hit an ad, but you can scroll through it. Right, so this is like those pop-up ads. Almost. We're, we're like, yeah. if you're scrolling yeah, we, through mobile and then it just says, hey, here's an ad and you X out of it and you keep reading. Yeah, which that one is, that's dangerous because I've been on sites through mobile where you can't actually get the stuff to close because yeah. it's not particularly built for it. So issues there. Uh, one that could work uh, is with video ads, moving them mid-roll instead of pre-roll. Um, so, so at least people get some amount of content. Although from my experience definitely drives me nuts when it's mid-roll but oh then gosh, again yeah. this is trying to drive monetization not all not only like everybody's experience i yeah. guess and honestly honestly i think i think ux and hf people have a huge huge battle if we're going to try to get that one to happen because it is not gonna the that pre-roll spot is so precious to advertisers like oh it is oh yeah, my gosh I did you're so you're even le- you're not even that likely to get people to see that nowadays. But I mean, if you put it mid, it's even less. So I mean, yeah. it, that's that's a big Agreed. fight up the up the chain. Just to really quick, but just to like pull back the curtain on the podcasting industry. So Apple Podcasts just came out with, um, oh, what are they? They're like advanced statistics that you can kind of look to see, you know, where people skip and where people listen. And so if people like stop listening 10 minutes into your podcast you know now and so so advertisers can now look at the stats regarding pre and mid and post rolls on podcasts and say okay well no one's listening to post rolls we're not going to pay you for those anymore then oh, same with mid rolls like oh people are listening to them but they're skipping through it where post roll is probably the only thing that you well i don't know i skip po- i skip them all when I listen. So who knows? Who knows? Yeah. The only time that I don't skip them is like a particular podcast I listen to. And it's because the guys are so entertaining in the way they do their ads that it, it makes it worth a laugh. <laughs> are you, uh, but other than that, yeah, for sure. I, I always skip that stuff. I think you're referencing a specific podcast and I almost want to call it out on the show, but I don't just in case. <laughs> uh, I bet you it is two different ones for you and I do you. Okay. Yeah, I'm talking about the fighter and the kid. Like they have the funniest ads that there have ever been. Okay, I'm uh, talking. I'm talking about Pod Save America. They have they have really good ads too. All right, uh, what is this next one here? So the other thing that's mentioned in the article is just upping the monetization uh, schemes that they have available to content creators. Uh, so right now, you just you can't you don't have the options through Facebook to make as much money as you would say like through YouTube. Um, in terms of just monetizing your ads. Now, that's going to grow over the next six months, or at least it's projected to. Right. Uh, but that was definitely a, a, a thing. It's just trying to bring people that actually will create content specifically for Facebook into the loop so they'll make more money. Um, the last one, which is by far probably the worst that was mentioned in the article, is in the news feed having ads. And as you guys know, this is pretty much like a passive experience, right? So they've, they've tried something similar to this, or at least beta tested it, but nobody actually clicks on the stuff they'll just go past it so this is now taking the passive experience and making you have to experience an ad uh, regardless of the fact that you're just like scrolling through whatever's in your news feed you know that one's interesting to me because i wonder so they they do target these obviously and 
uh, I actually find myself clicking on quite a few of them, and I'm actually surprised when I do, uh, because it's all for stuff that I enjoy, like Star Wars shit or whatever. So it's like, how do, <laughs> like, I don't know. I feel like this is really effective, and I'm actually surprised to hear you say that it doesn't work. Maybe it just works on suckers like me. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of their notes. It's like, just they didn't find that it was very much worth it. Now, it could be that the targeted ads are much better depending on how much information they have on you. Uh, and I think part of it is they're trying to bring in new publishers or uh, new people to help them generate revenue. So maybe what's existing is fine, but they're not, it's not going to give them right. like the bump in growth they're looking for. I got gotcha. you. All right, man, let's go ahead and move on to this last story here. This one's really interesting to me, and I love it. Let's do it. All right, so as brain-controlled robots enter everyday life, an article published in Science states that now it's time to take action and put in place guidelines that ensure the safe and beneficial use of direct brain-machine brain interaction. Authors break down the need to attribute the responsibility for semi-autonomous robots protecting biological data recorded by brain machine interfaces and discuss the implications of brain jacking. Now, Nick, this read to me very much kind of like, like Blade Runner or like some a, serious sci-fi novel. Cause the brain yeah. jacking part was just too scary and crazy for me. Yeah. Hang on. I want to, I want to comment more on brain jacking before we continue. They sure. give, okay. So they give the example of, uh, a, a paralyzed politician, who might be at increased risk of a malicious attack as brain readout improves. That is crazy to me. Forget about hacking elections and hacking the United States, like consciousness. You're, you're now actually hacking a person who is in charge of voting. Like that is, whoo, that's scary. Yeah. Like getting into an actual person's brain and being able to, to read what's going down and can, potentially control even what they do that's that's like a whole realm of just is this really happening right now right all right so let's dig into this so i want to talk first about this whole issue of uh the the uh the responsibility of semi-autonomous robots right so they're basically breaking this down they're saying if you you are controlling a a robot with your mind right and you drop a baby while you are controlling this device are you responsible or or is somebody else responsible for this? And this is not something that I actually even put thought into. No, I wouldn't <laughs> have thought about that either because it's it's such a strange conundrum of where do you actually put the blame? Or is I mean, because it's a, it's a faulty machinery? Right. Or is it because of the way you were thinking? And the, the part that I guess the only way to really tell, I would think, and this, I feel like this is going to get a little bit morbid, but you would have to basically be capturing people's brain data right so did, yeah did they think to drop the baby or was it just a robot's problem right exactly and yeah it, so we've talked about who's at fault and what the implications are for something like autonomous vehicles where they're on the road and you know all the decisions are automatic there's no real control for the human uh in those situations uh, sometimes there's assisted control but it's like this is this is assisted control. Who is who is responsible? And that yeah, it's it's just scary to me. So you mentioned brain data, and they also talk about the need to protect this this data as well. And and we, you know we do have some sort of um, some policies in place that protect like our our uh, personal information that we that are collected at like the doctors, right? So so. Um, it, they're just ex extrapolating that to brain data and uh, protecting that in in the case of like uh, if it could be used in court or something like that, something to that degree. And that's that's this is this always scares the crap out of me, man, because I, I got to be honest with you. I'm I'm freaked out just from Facebook, like key logging what my brain says in a chat if it was a BMI. Um, and so the fact that they're going to be actually the, in the future, presumably capturing all the, th the thoughts in my head. Yeah. It's a little scary. Yeah, it is. And I mean, they make a good point in the article too. Like we, there is, uh, there's different regulations for patient data or how you encrypt biological data, but that differs depending on the country that you're in too. So there's, there's no like 
wide guidelines sitting open. And now we're talking about like neuronal data sitting somewhere that could be just used to wreak all kinds of havoc, I feel like. So it's almost like at this point with these kinds of like BMIs getting much bigger, it seems like on a global scale, we'd have to come up with how, how encryption's going to work to stop hacking of any kind of like bio data of this guy, especially this brain data. Right. And then like regulations for how doctors can use it and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's a, it's a whole mess. I mean, it's really cool because it's super, super next level science in terms of like brain understanding how the brain works. And then like, not just understanding how it works, but gathering the data to be used to, you know, control something outside of your body. For sure. So on one hand, I'm terrified of my data being out there but that's <clears throat> that's the whole point is they're saying let's let's protect it let's be smart about it let's not let people access this with malicious in- malicious intent now the psychologist in me is going oh my gosh if i had access to anonymized brain data that revealed patterns of thinking it's a treasure trove of information and we would potentially using all this data available be able to model different ways our brain thinks and then uh you know engineer stuff to accommodate for that and that is super exciting to me so on one hand yeah don't take my data but if i can have your data that's amazing let's do it (laughs) oh yeah well let's let's take that a whole level further i mean we talk about all the time on the show about machine learning, which you're basically feeding in existing data into an algorithm. Well, now what if you can feed like basically thoughts, feelings, and emotions into an algorithm that can produce a more like, uh, I guess human intoned AI system. Have a, yeah, you could teach a computer emotion. Woo. Now we're getting into some uh, artificial intelligence, uh, like actual, science fiction artificial intelligence not the ai as we know it in the field but yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> scary <Woo>. stuff <laughs> all right let's talk about brain jacking for a little bit so brain jacking to me just highlights uh another need for increased legislation and protection against cybersecurity because that's what it is just on another level where you can potentially take over somebody's body which is straight out of a science fiction film. Oh, 100%. But the, I don't know, maybe this is the the dark psychologist in me thinking about it, but if you put it out there in the world as an idea, it's likely to at least happen once, right? Like, this is, this is not something uh-huh. you can lock down and all protect against. Like, as we've seen over at least the past, like, nine months, hackers are super savvy people, and they can figure out how to get around anything as technology advances. Uh, so th- I, I don't know. This is a likely scenario and something something to be taken very seriously, for yeah. sure. Yeah, and I mean, I bring it up every time we talk about cybersecurity, but it was a major talking point of HFES 2016, and I'm wondering if that threat is going to continue in a- at HFES 2017. And it'll be interesting to kind of go around and see what people have been doing in the field um, as it pertains to human factors. Uh, it's not my area of uh, expertise, but I, I'm definitely interested because it's exactly these types of reasons that we're talking about with the brain jacking that I'm like, yeah, it's necessary. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I think we emphasize it enough that cybersecurity is just like the biggest frontier coming or it's here but i mean i think that's where you'll see the biggest advances and the biggest changes in in warfare information technology just how we think about the world in general is the digital age just keeps going oh yeah for sure for sure all right do we have any closing thoughts on the news stories this week oh i think we've hit all the high notes yeah i definitely an interesting week in news i actually really dug these stories this week I think yeah, uh, I did. I did too. I really liked the uh, variety in them. To be honest with you, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, I I liked them. All right, but uh, let's go ahead and switch gears here and get to our it came from Reddit section. You know what? I should uh, hang on. Let's let's get some special effects going here. It came from Reddit. Wait, there we go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so 
Uh, it came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics that you guys, our community, is talking about. So that any subreddit is fair game as long as it relates to human factors and encourages discussion among the community. All right, so today's entry was found on the user experience subreddit from Nuno. I'm going to read it like that because it makes sense. Hello, Nuno writes, Hello, I've been doing web design for three years and UX for about one year. Mainly applied to websites and Android apps. I use all, all sorts of in-context techniques to provide the best possible outcome for those products. I asked this question because I only did use... Uh, wait, sorry. Did I miss something? I asked this question because I only did UX as a one-man team. I never had a team to discuss with and figure stuff out. Uh, hold on. So the, the title of this one... Do you have the title of this one, Blake? The title of it is, is, what is it like to work on a UX team? There we go. All right. So using the, in context now. Hello, I've been de designing web design for three years and UX for about one year, mainly applied to websites and Android apps. I use all sorts of in context techniques to provide the best possible outcome for those products. I asked this question. What's the question, Blake? What's it like to work on a UX team? There we go. Because I only did UX as a one man team. I've never had a team to discuss with and figure stuff out. And I would like to know how it is to work with a team. How is the daily work spread? How do you organize and prepare interviews slash card sorting, etc.? This is because I'm thinking of switching jobs so I can work in a team and to grow as a professional and a person. Thank you in advance. Cheers. Well, cheers back to you, Nuno. And uh, sorry for that mishap with the uh, lack of the question first. <laughs> Blake, I want to know what... Uh, I want to pick your brain about... Um, working in a team what what kind of things can you suggest or or just what is your experience working in a team and what can you tell nuno so there here's a couple things so first off props to you nuno if you've like been doing ux on your own and applying it to your own web design projects that's really cool to hear uh, the biggest thing about working with a team is I think the last part that you talk about is what you're going to see the most. You're going to grow as a professional, as a person. I mean, that's the, that's the biggest deal because I don't know how you've been working. If it's just been like you siloed, that's kind of what it sounds like. But even if you're working remotely with people, like getting other inputs from different fields, um, like from, from your developers, from your product manager, from your stakeholders that are ab above the whole thing, from customers. I mean, it just gives you a better sense of how you can apply what you know um in terms of working in like a strictly like user experience team i've actually not had that experience i like nick have actually been lucky enough in my opinion to work on an all human factors team which is a little bit different um in terms of what we how we would approach problems or projects we might work on but at the end of the day i mean the daily work spread is like any other team that you would work in i mean you have people you have basically somebody who manages you so you can think of that like a product manager and then the rest of it's kind of like distributed amongst your teammates for depending on their skill set so if somebody's really good at developing research plans put them on it somebody's really good at design throw them on it you got a developer or somebody who's good at writing spec code you put them on it um i don't know i couldn't recommend more at least getting the experience of working at, as a team at a job for one to two years just to give you that experience professionally because uh, it'll likely sh help shape like your worldview as well as how you design and move forward as a web designer. Uh, sure. What about you, Nick? What's your experience or your points for this guy? So, okay. I have, I, I am actually very thankful that you picked this question for this week, Blake, because I have the perspective of kind of, I have like three different perspectives. So I've, I've worked alone on projects. Uh, I've worked, with a UX team and now I'm working with a whole human factors team and it varies greatly. So working alone, you have full control uh, pretty much unless you're working within the constraints of, if you're working on a, your own project, you have pretty much full control over the design and implementation. If you're working for somebody else, obviously you have, you're constrained a little bit, but you still have fair, fairly free reign regarding it. Working in a UX team is a little bit different. So uh, when I worked with a UX team, there was a lot of uh, ideation. Uh, it, it was a team of five or six, and we would all kind of contribute to our strengths, right? So 
I was the human factors guy. We had a design guy. We had a prototyper. We had um, a couple like uh, designers that would um, that would actually mock them up. So so it was a it, w- it was a tight knit team. We'd work together on everything um, and kind of. You know, I would do the research, the user research aspect of it, and they would do the designing aspect of it, and it was it was it was really nice because there was this this uh, fairly synergistic handoff, where uh, uh, sorry, I'm just geeking out over the fact that I was able to use the word synergistic on the podcast, but uh, that was really good. By thank the way. you, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, there's this really synergistic handoff where I would research and then uh, convey what I knew to the other team members, and you know, we would all talk about it and say. Uh, I would I would kind of give like a rough design and then they would iterate on that design and and we'd go forward from there. And it was it was really nice. And then um, working with an all human factors team is is a little bit different from that, where we are all coming to the table where we are all trying to figure out what the user needs. And and we're interviewing users and we're we're going off and doing our own thing. And we do a little bit of design work, but the actual implementation uh, that handoff is a little bit different, right? So we'll work with like external developers or whatnot, and and it's uh it's a little bit different. It's not as tight knit as working in a team where you can actually hand it over to a coder to mock up in a coded prototype. Uh, I echo Blake's thoughts where obviously the more experience that you get working with a team, it's obviously going to uh, help you work better with others and. Because uh, you're you're always going to be doing work for somebody, and you always want to accommodate them. But I I got to say the biggest strength of working with a team is highlighting your shortcomings. Nobody's perfect, and when I would design by myself, I would come up with a million different wrong things, and just having an extra set of eyes on those to say, hey, why don't we do this instead? And uh, the biggest thing is to not have an ego about it, right? If if you're okay with critique. Uh, that's that's great. If you're not okay with critique, I don't think this field is for you, honestly. But um, you know th- that that's the biggest thing is getting a second pair of eyes or a third pair of eyes on it and just iterating off of it and bouncing ideas off of other people. It's amazing what other people can come up with. One hundred percent. And I think you you hit on something that's really important, and it's the uh, if you're not <laughs> if you're not okay with critique this will help you get okay with it quickly or else your ego will get in the way and you won't be able to move past it. So this is a really good way to kind of get you moving and being able to take the criticisms that other people have, even if they're not put to you in the best way. And I think that's like a really good way to grow as a professional nonetheless, because you're not always going to get that great manager or great teammates to give you constructive criticism. Sometimes you're just going to have to bear the brunt of something that comes at you that people want changed. For sure, for sure. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nuno, for writing in. Well, I guess you didn't write in. We found you on Reddit. But hopefully this is helpful to you. That's going to be it for today, everyone. Let us know what you think of It Came From Reddit. We're still soliciting feedback. Leave us a review. Uh, Did you like it? Hate it? Let us know. If you have any suggestions for topics that you think we may have missed or news stories, whatever it is, uh, you can head on over to our social media. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn page or Facebook or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC, as in Human Factors Cast. You can support us on Patreon because we bring these things to you ad-free because we love you. And, uh, you know, you can do that at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us. I've asked, this is the third time I've asked for reviews this show. I feel like I'm needy. (laughs) On Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast at gmail. No, (laughs) humanfactorscast.com. Wow. All right. It's been a long day, everyone. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for helping me hold down the fort today. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners find you? As always, guys, you can catch me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. All right. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me crying uh, over emotional things and messing up the outro over at Nick underscore Rome on LinkedIn or Twitter. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. And until, until next time, it depends on how. It depends, kids. <laughs> it depends on how bad I mess up the outro. All right. Bye, everybody. See you next week.